If you're watching this video, that means that the channel just hit 100,000 subscribers. I want to thank all my viewers for their support, and I hope you enjoy some of the best moments from the channel from the past year. So one thing that's kind of funny about this journal is they have the best paper awards, and they give their best paper award to every uh, issue. And the funny thing is, if you click the download article button, you get this interesting not found thing, and it says, you seem to be trying to find his way home. And I don't know why I'm trying to find his way home, but hopefully he finds his way home. I also have a story. I got my first semester biology professor about a lab incident. As a grad student, he was conducting a vivisection of a rat that he had anesthetized with diethyl ether. He was undertaking this in a fume hood, but on the other side of the hood was also being used by another person who was heating a solution over a Bunsen burner. You might see where this is going at this point. You wouldn't think that the flow from the hood would allow the burner on the other side to ignite the ether fumes. I imagine that that was his rationale, but that's exactly what happened. Suddenly the rat was on fire and, and is right next to an open bottle of ether. His first instinct is to get the flames away from the bottle, so in a panic he grabs the flaming rat and throws it across the room, where it slides across the floor into the hallway, right as his department head is walking by. Now, that is absolutely a crazy story, and I think a flaming rat in a research lab and then in a hallway as the head of your department goes by is one of the absolute worst things that could happen. But hey, at least nobody other than the dead rat was harmed. One of my fellow lab students told me this. In one of the early undergrad lab courses, they had to do a reaction with chlorine. Their assistant was helping and everything was fine until a rat came through the venting system into the fume hood. That poor animal died of chlorine poisoning after it took a few steps next to the cylinder. The poor student had to burn the dead rat to ashes because they legally could not get rid of it otherwise. That dying rat was one of the creepiest things he ever saw. Yeah, I, I think if your ventilation system is letting rats move around, you should probably get someone to look into that. Um, rest in peace, rat. You know, if you feel sorry for the rat, make sure you uh, pour out some cola for that poor rat. Now let's try and choose another interesting one. Oh wait, we have Grimace here. Grimace is awesome. Grimace is so great. Grimace is the least cringe thing on here. He's going to go right into F tier because he's so based. Show some love for Grimace down in the comments. And so I just like shot the laser right at that one spot, uh, held it for a bit, not too much happened. So I moved the laser even closer to the flask. And uh, as I did that, it got like bubbling faster and faster and faster and faster until it got really hot and just blew out the stopper. And it was like, foomp, and it shot and it exploded into a million pieces at the top of my fume hood and my whole fume hood was covered in shrapnel. And then the chlorine gas started coming out of this. So I took out the stopper and as I did that, it just filled the entire headspace of the entire glove box with white gas. And I'm like, oh no. And then if that wasn't bad enough, the whole flask just sprayed its contents out like a geyser and absolutely baptized our glove box in very corrosive deoxyflor. So if you don't know what deoxyflor is, it's a deoxyfluorinating agent. Usually it'll react with alcohols, ketones, carbonyls, and replace the OH with a fluorine. And so basically this is like making HF on everything in the glove box. Now hopefully there's no water, but there's, you know, probably hydroxyl groups somewhere in there and all those hydroxyl groups have now fluorine. And so there's a lot of HF in the glove box essentially is what's happening. So anyway, if you're curious what that looked like, we'd already wiped off the front part of the um, glove box so that we could see in, but you could see it's absolutely just annihilated our scale. In this next image, you can see the top of the glove box, after I thought I'd already cleaned the rest of it off, still had a ton because all the stuff shot up and then stuck to it. A lot of these compounds <laughs> I have a grudge against just for their color, so I better not mention that too many times. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's fair enough. Yeah, you know, you can be racist against molecules as long as they're not people, right? Let's go to amino acid number four. This is methionine. The description on this one is rotten egg. I'm not looking forward to this one. If you don't believe me that there's some on this spoon, the second camera here should pick it up. Uh, this is an F tier one. This is not good. <laughs> that one's just F tier. It's bitter and bad. It has an umami taste, but there's this overwhelming sense of yuck. <laughs> I think the E tier ranking for histabine histabine um okay next we have another one that i'm dreading to taste cysteine i'm only going to put a couple here cysteine's taste is described as rotten egg so that's great let's test one crystal of cysteine <laughs> it's so zappy 
happy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, it's so acidic. <laughs> that is so bad. That is way worse than methionine. <laughs> not even eating a second crystal of that one. That's disgusting. That is F tier. And we're moving methionine out of F tier into E tier. Because that is way worse than methionine. And with a french fry, it is like... It's like a poop french fry. It is F tier. It is disgusting. That is not at all good. That is so gross. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad. And I only ate one crystal of it. And it's disgusting. That is not good. Don't eat cysteine. I can still taste it. Oh, that was so bad. Why am I doing this? It just highlights some other flavors of the French fly. French fly. I think phenylalanine's cool. For whatever reason, I think it's just one of the cooler amino acids. Even though it's relatively simple, it's just cool. So, phenylalanine. Yeah, that's not good. Eh. Yeah. This one also tastes skunky. What the heck? <laughs> Phenylalanine is... <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> this is an F tier. It's... It's... It's like... I don't even really know how to describe the taste. It's kind of like burning tar. It tastes like burning tar. It tastes the way a railroad track smells. It's not good. It's just so skunky. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. This is not, not a good thing. Why am I doing this? Now, you might be interested to know that the symbol for phenylalanine is an F for F-U. So I don't want you to get too disappointed, but why don't we talk about clitoriacetal? Clitoriacetal was an interesting one to try and find more information about. This one actually was hard to find, and if you don't believe me, you can try Googling its name. Nothing will come up. And yeah, I did eventually find it, but it was a struggle to find it. The most ironic thing about this compound is it's a natural product, and it comes from a very unfortunately named plant called Clitoria Fairchildania. I think both of these can go right into S tier because, ooh, these are uh, pretty spicy molecules. You can actually see that we have this one again, and uh, we can save this one for a tier list if we ever talk about plastic pony figurines. So this is the americium vaping story. I like to tinker with things, and I'm curious how things are put together. Recently, I pulled apart an ionizing smoke alarm to see what's inside, up close and dirty. If you're not sure how smoke alarm works, I'll include a link to a recent technology connections video. That's another YouTube creator that goes by TC. I even pulled apart the ionization chamber because I wanted to see what the americium 241 source looked like. I knew I was safe, well, safe-ish, as alpha particles can't penetrate the skin. Job done. I left the piece on my work desk to dispose of later on. I moved on to my next toy, which is a black mamba vaporizer which had just come through the post. I loaded it up with some dry herb and medicated myself. So we actually have a picture of what their americium source looked like. So this is just metal, this is probably stainless steel or nickel, and this disc in the middle is what the americium source is. And so you can see that they've actually dug it out, so they dug out the americium source. Now what's kind of unfortunate is I guess they have some sort of magnetic material that's like a filler for the disc, and so what happened is that is magnetic and then it ended up going and connecting to part of their vaporizer. All good so far, but what I hadn't noticed was the americium 241 pellet must have somehow attached itself to the magnet clip on the vaporizer and ended up in the burning chamber. Oh no. I thought the hits on the vaporizer had a funny smell and taste, but I thought nothing more of it, as it's new, and it was probably just the protective coating burning off, even after I had primed it a couple of times. Attached a couple pictures of the pellet thingy. After being in the vaporizer, the black paint-like stuff in the middle seems grayer or gone. Maybe it's all burned off and vaporized? The vaporizer gets up to 220 degrees celsius in temperature so yeah i think i vaped some americium 241 do i need to be worried yes yes you do you definitely should be worried i'm worried oh this story is just so stupid for so many reasons i don't even know what to say about this but you shouldn't be playing with americium and just because something's not that radioactive 
doesn't mean it's not a heavy metal. Heavy metals are still toxic in their own right. Sometimes we focus so much on one type of toxicity or one type of hazard that we neglect to recognize other significant properties that can make something really toxic. So yeah, this is an obvious throwaway. And I went and checked and they've posted other posts before, so it seems legit. You can let me know if you think that this is real or not down below, but it seems real. Could you make a video about how to manage a hypothetical, inofficial, on-property waste disposal site, aka a chem pit? Uh, <laughs> preferably the owner of such a chem pit wouldn't like to have the authorities notice funky stuff in the groundwater and still be able to grow carrots in his garden. And I think uh, this person, Zocker Twin, said it best. There are three options. One, don't get into such a mess in the first place. Dispose of your chemicals properly. Two, get a qualified contractor to properly, properly clean it up because you didn't follow advice, number one. Number three, cover it up. Move to another place and live with the thought in your head that some innocent children might dig it up and ingest the stuff at any time. So, you know, definitely, definitely do not have a chem pit. That is a terrible, terrible idea. Next, we have propofol. Propofol is colloquially known as milk of amnesia because it's milky and white. It's a short-acting medication that results in a decreased level of consciousness and a lack of memory for events. Its uses include the starting and maintenance of general anesthesia, and it gets used in a few other procedures. I personally was given propofol when I got all of my wisdom teeth removed, and the experience was quite odd. It was like I was given it, and I stopped being aware of what was going on, and several hours later, I was sitting in a room that was different than the room I was in. I remember briefly when they moved me between rooms. It felt like it could have been an eternity or just a few moments that I was sitting in that room before a family member came to collect me. After we left the room, suddenly we were in the elevator. Suddenly we were down the elevator. And there was this store that sold rocks. I was like, oh, rocks. I love rocks. I want to get I want to get some rocks at this rock store. And the family member that was with me was like, uh, we can go to this place another time to get rocks. I'm like, oh, OK, fine. And the fact that I agreed to not go to the rock store is how you know there was something wrong with me. It turned out that a couple days later, we were in the area again. And that was not a rock store. It was a bookstore. And they just happened to have a couple rocks in the display. Yeah. Now, while the memory of all of that stuff occurring was suppressed, I had this moment later in the night when I was sitting on the couch where like the entire day flashed before my eyes and I had the sensation of all of the movements that the surgeon was doing in my mouth flash before my eyes in the matter of a few seconds. And it was like the whole day flashed before my eyes and it was quite unsettling. Propofol is also the medication that Michael Jackson OD'd on and people who've administered this to themselves have overdosed and passed away in many occasions. Propofol has several different mechanisms of action, but it's believed that its primary activity is through potentiating the GABA-A receptor. Propofol is fairly effective, but it needs to be given in an IV, so it's not too practical aside from surgery. This can go into E tier. The first person to test out this chemistry was Frank. In this beaker, we have approximately 5.7 grams of hair, which actually looks like a lot. That looks probably like a 100 milliliter beaker. You'd be surprised how light and fluffy hair is or maybe you wouldn't. Afterwards, this was washed. So you can see here, we have our nice washed beaker of hair. After the washing process, the hair was dried. And finally, the hair was cut up and weighed. Now I haven't told you about the most interesting part of this whole story. Let me back up for a minute here. As I said earlier, the optimal hair for this procedure was to use brown female hair. That's what the authors identified. So Frank is an absolute MVP. Frank asked his supervisor, who happens to be a female with brown hair, if she would be willing to contribute her hair to this project. And she, in fact, was extremely willing to. So massive shout out to Frank, as well as Frank's supervisor, for contributing to this project. I thought that that was amazing, and it makes this whole video way funnier. The idea is that the carrot has some of that, and that can react with certain things that can be reduced. And so if you stick a ketone in there, someone figured you could do this. Now, I don't know who figured this out, I don't know if they came to the lab high one day or something, but someone decided this reduction isn't working. I'm going to use a carrot. And, you know, if someone said that, I would probably tell them to come back when they're sober. Next, we have a personal favorite of mine. And if you're in the fluorine chemistry community, you might have seen this before. This is what I like to call Lectica's Illegal Fluoronium. There is supposed to be an oxygen on this left one. I've just rotated it slightly so you can see a bit more of the geometry. I think the fact that I accidentally deleted that oxygen makes it a little bit more illegal. And you might be wondering to yourself, why is this illegal? And who's Thomas Lectica? So Lectica is this really amusing guy. He's quite quirky and he has a couple of interesting practices. 
The last time I saw Electica at a conference, he just decided to wear a t-shirt, which I thought was kind of amusing. Now, he also has this weird quirk of how he holds a wine glass. He holds it right by the bottom every single time. And as a result of that, I will exclusively hold wine glasses by the base because I think it's so hilarious. Now, while this fluorine bridges these two carbons, I'm probably burning my own bridges talking about this. But hey, it's all for you, YouTube. Welcome back. I'm That Chemist. And today we're going to be deciding which molecules have the most drip. If you're not sure what drip is, it's when you have some real bling, when you're looking smooth AF. Drip is when you have swag, which is straight fire. When you have drip, you have a real stylish outfit. It's something that'll stand out, that people definitely notice. And these molecules have some drip that you'll 100% notice. Now, cubanes. Cubanes are an interesting class of molecules, although uh, other members of the chemistry community have uh, struggled to synthesize them in a timely manner. If you're not a true fan, you can leave the video now and have a nice day. Wow, so those are some amazing moments. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. It was really fun revisiting all the best moments on the channel in the past year. Thanks for watching, thanks for your support, and hey, I hope you have a great day. Thump. Thump. Okay, great. Lovely. Thump. 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 Boom. Thump. 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 Thump.